But uh, anyway, Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. <clears throat> this is where John sees a scene in heaven that is just almost disturbing. Here, God the Father, verse 1 of chapter 5, in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll written on within and on the backside and then sealed with seven seals. Now, I always bring it out, you know, that this scroll is the mortgage. It's the mortgage that Satan has on planet Earth. And he picked it up, of course, when Adam fell. When Adam lost his dominion, Satan picked it up, and he's been the god of this world ever since. The world lieth in the lap of the wicked one is one statement. And another one, I think uh, Jesus himself said it, that he is the god of this world. Well, anyway, God is now holding this mortgage, ready to be paid off, but Satan is the real holder of it. He's got the mortgage on the planet. And John wept because evidently there was no one in heaven, certainly not on earth, that could pay off this awful mortgage. Verse 4 is where he said it. I wept much because no man was found worthy to open or to read the book or to look thereon. And then verse 5, one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, he hath prevailed to open the book or the scroll and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and of course it was the Lamb, it's the Christ, it's the Son that God had sent forth into all the earth. Verse 7, He, God the Son, qualified now because of what He had accomplished at Calvary, He came and took the scroll out of the right hand of Him who sat upon the throne. And then verse 9, I'm just sort of hitting the highlights here, they sang a new song, the heavenly host. Thou, speaking of the Son, art worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain, and you have redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation, made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So anyway, God the Son then takes this mortgage, and he agrees to pay it off in order to lift the planet or to deliver the planet of the curse. Now, I haven't got time in this program, but you see, again, that goes back into the Israeli history of how they would redeem and how they would gain back title to land that they had almost lost by default. And it had to be a next of kin, remember. It had to be someone who was capable, had what it took, and willing. Now, you see, Jesus is the only one in all of eternity that could fulfill those requirements for this mortgage because he was the next of kin. He's the Son of God. He certainly had the power and all the attributes to carry it out, and he is willing to do it. And so he becomes then the great payer of this mortgage that Satan is holding. So then if you come back to Matthew 24, this beginning of sorrows is really just the beginning of the earth pangs or the birth pangs that is coming on the earth as a prelude to the delivery from the curse. Always remember, because that's the language the scripture uses, that the earth is going to be delivered from the power of Satan and the curse. But these tribulation events are part of the, what shall I call it? These are going to be the things in trade that God will use to pay Satan off in full. Verse 9, then, in other words, once this tribulation begins, this last seven years of Daniel chapter 9, when these last seven years begin, then they shall deliver you. Now remember, he's talking to what people? To Jews. So it's the Jews again that are going to come under the particular wrath of this period of time. Israel has some horrible days ahead of her. And they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, they shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations. Now if we think anti-Semitism is bad now or has been bad, it's nothing like it's going to be. It's going to turn worse. And then verse 10, then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. 
In other words, I think even, even within the Jewish family, children are going to report on their parents. Parents will report on their children as just a, a system of, of escaping the, the wrath that's falling upon them as a nation of people. And then verse 11, and many false prophets. Oh, how the scripture is constantly warning of the false prophets. Not only just in the tribulation, but even during the church age. See, Christianity had no more than just begun. Paul had no more than just established a few churches. And what pops up? False teachings. See? This is why he had to write the little book of Galatians, because he had no more than gotten these Gentiles out of paganism, under the gospel of grace, and in come Jewish false teachers. Oh, you can't be saved by that. You have to keep the law. You have to practice circumcision. And so the false teaching has been uh, a bulwark against Christianity from day one. And so even here in, in these tribulation days, as all the calamities are falling and people will be grasping for just something, the false teachers are going to have a heyday. Verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound. Now think about it for a moment. The only deterrent to wickedness in the world today is what people? The believer. The church. We're the only deterrent. Because let's face it. I've heard sociologists now and uh, some of the powers that be are beginning to recognize that a society without religion is a society that's doomed because religion is the only thing that puts any kind of common sense into regulating behavior of the human being. But we have to realize that most of the pagan religions of the world are so grossly immoral, even in their religious practice, that what we think is horrendous <clears throat> taking place now in America, in other words, the breakdown of our, of our morality and the casualness of, of gross immorality. Hey, it's been that way in the Orient for centuries. They didn't think anything of it. They, they, they think nothing of prostitution. They, they think nothing of all these things because even in spite of their religion, you see, it's still just part of their society. Now, it has become so frightening to us here in America because we're coming out of a basic Christian structure, the Judeo-Christian structure at least, and now when we see the falling apart of all this, we're shocked, and we should be. But for the rest of the world, you know, it's pretty much been that way down through the centuries. But nevertheless, for the big part of the, of the Western world, if I may use that expression, Christianity has been the break on a falling away of moral principles. It's the Christian who has had to stand in the gap and say, hey, now wait a minute, this is wrong. All right, now you take that all away. You take away every believer. You take away the Holy Spirit in his role as he works today. What have you got left to hold back iniquity? Nothing. Nothing. Now, you know, I live right down there next to the dam that holds Lake Eufaula. And I've often wondered, especially when you look at the map and you see the huge miles that Lake Eufaula covers, if someone were to all of a sudden just lift that dam out, what in the world would happen all the way from Whitefield, Oklahoma to the Mississippi River? Well, I can just envision a flood of tremendous impact. It would just literally inundate, destroy everything in its path. All right, now, on the higher plane then of, of behavior and morality, what if you lift the Christian influence out and there's nothing to hold back the forces of iniquity. What's going to happen? Just what Jesus says. Iniquity is going to abound, see? And the love of many shall wax cold. They'll just simply lose all perspective of spiritual things. Verse 13. But 
he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, we got to be careful. Does enduring save anybody? No. Jesus isn't talking about salvation by virtue of enduring the tribulation. He is just simply saying that if someone has the wherewithal, physically, mentally, and every other way, to come to the end of the tribulation, then yes, he's going to be spared from all the horrendous things of it. But I do not believe that he's talking here about salvation as we think of. It's just that he's going to survive these horrible events that will be unleashed in that seven-year period. And then, <clears throat> in verse 14, I think I've got enough time to at least deal with this verse, and it's going to come out just about right, and then we can start the next program with the last half of the tribulation. And that is in verse 14, Jesus is speaking toward the end of his earthly ministry, and as I've been pointing out now for at least the last eight, ten weeks, what gospel have they been preaching? The gospel of the kingdom. And this is exactly what he's referring to when he says, and this gospel of the kingdom. Now, why does he use the word this? Because it's what's contemporary with him at that time. And so that gospel of the kingdom, which he calls this, shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Now, who's going to fulfill that? Well, the 144,000 Jews, as they will circumvent the globe during that seven years of tribulation, not preaching the gospel of the grace of God, but preaching rather the gospel of the kingdom, because the gospel of the kingdom says the king is coming. See? And indeed he is in just a little less than seven years. And so... So many well-meaning folk have totally twisted this verse as if we have to get the gospel to every nation on earth, and then when that's happened, Christ will come. Well, that isn't what it means. Not that we aren't to get the gospel out. If it weren't for that, I wouldn't be here. But it isn't the gospel of the kingdom that we're proclaiming, but Jesus said that in this future day that he's talking about, this seven-year period, these 144,000 Jews will be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. And they're going to succeed in touching every nation, tribe, and language before Christ returns. And so that's exactly what this verse is talking about. For it'll be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. See how all-inclusive this is? And then shall the end come. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kinta, Oklahoma, 74552 that's route one box 760 kinta oklahoma 74552 through the bible with les feldick is viewer supported and your gift is appreciated thank you and be sure to tune in next time for through the bible with les feldick